Let's remind ourselves, of course, that the Qur'an is a book 1,400 years old. Muslims believe it was revealed by God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Allah is the Arabic name for God. The one God, the creator, the all-knowing, the all-wise. So it's not surprising to us as Muslims that the Qur'an should be accurate and should be consistent because it is revealed by the one who is the most all-knowing, who is the all-knowing and who is the wise. So, of course, it's natural, it's normal for us. We'd expect it to be accurate and be consistent. But, of course, for people today, and many people are claiming they don't believe that there's a God or they don't believe that God sends us guidance and revelation, it remains a challenge to you. And it remains a sign, a great sign, a proof and evidence that every Muslim through it and by it gets more certainty and gets more sure that the Qur'an is indeed what it claims to be, the revelation from the mighty, the wise. And so let's talk about some of those historical facts in the Qur'an. Now, first of all, um, there is a story in the Qur'an about a great prophet of God called Noah. And this prophet is also, of course, mentioned in the Bible. And I'm sure you all know the story of Noah, how God sent Noah to his people, and the people of Noah refused to believe in him. And because of that, God sent upon them a flood. Now, before that flood, God told Noah to build an ark. Now, there's a few things about the story of Noah in the Qur'an. One of the things that's worth mentioning is in the 11th surah, or 11th chapter of the Qur'an, in the 44th ayah, the Qur'an mentions that the ark, that's the boat that Noah built, came to rest upon Mount Judi, Istawa Judi. Istawa came to rest upon the mountain of Judi. Now, the Qur'an is mentioning a specific name of the mountain where the ark of Noah came to rest. And it's very interesting that recent archaeological research around the area of Mount Judi. In fact, there is a Mount Judi in Turkey, in present-day Turkey. And on this Mount Judi, there is a boat-shaped object with exactly the same dimensions as the Ark of Noah. Now, the Bible claims that the Ark came to rest on Mount Ararat, which is in fact 20 miles away from Mount Judy. And there's a few problems with the biblical description. The first problem is that the mountains of Ararat, or the Mount Ararat itself, is a relatively recent geological formation. If we look at the time scale, when the Ark of Noah was supposed to be around, the Mount Ararat did not actually exist at that time. It is very recent geological formation. So that's one problem. And also the dates and the times offered in the Bible flood and also the claim that in the Bible that the flood was a universal cataclysm. They don't fit the present day archaeological and scientific findings. First of all, of course, in scientific terms, the idea that it could rain for 40 days and 40 nights constantly upon the Earth's surface is scientifically not viable. Of course, anyone could explain that by saying it was a miracle of God, it was an exception. Of course, we cannot argue that God has the ability and the power to do that. But what we are saying is that in scientific terms, for it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, it's not possible, as anybody who knows how the water cycle works. The sun heats up the earth's surface, heats up the sea, and the vapor from the sea is what is transformed into clouds, and the clouds are then transformed into rain. Now, of course, if it is cloudy all over the earth's surface because of the rain, then how can the sun heat up the sea in order to produce more rain? All I'm pointing out here is that scientifically it's not viable. Also, there is simply a not water, enough water on this planet in order to raise the sea level so high uh, that, as according to the Bible, every single mountain peak was covered. Since Everest is the highest mountain peak today, and it still was then, uh, the amount of water that would be needed in order to raise the sea level above the level of Mount Everest is more than there is water on this planet in order to do that. 
Again, we're not denying that God could do it if he wants to. All we're saying is that in scientific terms, it's very difficult to verify such a claim that the Bible makes. However, the Quran does not claim that the flood of Noah was a universal worldwide cataclysm. In fact, the Quran clearly refers to the punishment that is bestowed upon Noah and his people as being something that is specific to Noah and his people. Uh, and so although we don't have any geological evidence for a universal cataclysm, we do of course have plenty of geological evidence for local cataclysmic floods. So this is very interesting that the Quran, first of all, accurately points out that the ark came to rest on Mount Judy, and it seems that there is a very, very high probability that the bolt-shaped object and surveys have been done of it is the remnants of a massive bolt. And where is it found on Mount Judy, as the Quran says? As for looking for the ark on Mount Ararat, people have searched in vain for years and years and found nothing. Bible describes a cataclysmic, universal, worldwide event, whereas the Qur'an describes it as a local event. Again, what we find here is that the Qur'an is in agreement with archaeological and scientific data. It's perfectly acceptable and it's viable and verifiable according to that. Let's go to Egypt and look for some more amazing historical facts. The Qur'an mentions the story of Joseph and Noah and the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. Of course, Muslims believe that Joseph, or Yusuf, as he is mentioned in the Quran, was a prophet of God. Muslims also believe that Musa, or Moses, may peace, God's peace and blessings be upon both of them, was also a prophet of God. And their stories are mentioned in the Quran by way of a reminder, by way of a teaching to us and that is, of course, the main purpose of the Qur'an, is to be a moral guideline. It's to show us how we should live and how we should behave in our life. But yet, when the Qur'an is talking about historical data, what we find again and again that it proves to be accurate. And there are some accuracies, telling little accuracies, that actually, if one thinks about it, are truly remarkable. And it stands as a challenge to the human intellect. How does this information come to be so remarkably accurate in the Qur'an? From where was the Prophet Muhammad gathering this information? A man who was himself illiterate, who could not read, who could not write. He didn't go to university. They didn't have Egyptology as a field of study at that time. The knowledge of hieroglyphs was lost hundreds and hundreds of years before the time of the Prophet Muhammad. So how come? When the Qur'an mentions about Joseph, Joseph refers to the leader of the Egyptian people at the time as king. The term Pharaoh or Pharaon is not mentioned in relation to Joseph and the ruler of Egypt. It is mentioned in relation to Moses and the ruler of Egypt, and Moses calls the ruler of Egypt Pharaon. But Joseph does not call the ruler with whom he is interacting, and who he acts as an advisor and a guide. He doesn't call him Pharaoh, he calls him king. Joseph, or Prophet Yusuf, as he is mentioned in the Qur'an, alayhi salam, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. He talks to the ruler of Egypt and uses the term king. He never uses the term Pharaoh. Now, if we examine the date timeline of when Joseph, or Prophet Yusuf, was in Egypt, we find that the dynasty ruling Egypt at the time, was in fact a dynasty called the Hykos. Now the Hykos dynasty was actually a Semitic dynasty, and they did not use the normal native Egyptian terms. In other words, they did not think of themselves or refer to themselves as pharaohs. However, the Hykos dynasty, by the time of Moses, was replaced. So by the time it came to the time of Moses, the Semite Hykos dynasty was removed and was replaced by a native Egyptian ruler. And the native Egyptians called their rulers Pharaoh, or Pharaon as it's mentioned in the Quran. Now, this is a very, very telling, but amazing, detailed accuracy. 
it's amazing because you will not find the Bible making such a distinction. Now, in terms of a historical document, a sort of diary of events of, you know, your ancestors who lived thousands of years ago and uh, writing down what they did, of course, it, it might be perfectly acceptable in those type of terms to become confused between king and pharaoh, for example. However, for it to be the word of God, we should expect it to be accurate. And that's exactly what we find. And it also, by the way, belies any claim that the Qur'an was copied from the Bible. If the Qur'an was copied from the Bible, and if the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, took his information from the Bible, how come he didn't copy that mistake? How come Joseph does not refer to the ruler of Egypt as Pharaoh? And how come he refers to him as king? Historically accurate, but not according to the Bible. So this shows us two things. Number one, it begs the question again, how did the Prophet Muhammad get this information so accurate? Number two, there is no way he could have copied from the Bible because he would have copied the mistakes of the Bible. And let's move on now to the time of Moses for another amazing historical accuracy. In the confrontation between the great prophet of God, Moses, and Pharaoh, when Moses comes to Pharaoh and he shows him the miracles and the signs that God has given him, the staff, which when Moses throws it, it turns into a snake and he draws his hand out and it comes shining white. In the dialogue and the discussion and the debate, we could say, between Moses and Pharaoh, one of the things that Pharaoh says very arrogantly, he says, O oh, Haman, build me a lofty tower that I may look upon this God of Moses. Now, let's examine this. It's very interesting. Pharaoh is saying, O oh, Haman, he's talking to somebody, a particular individual, Haman. And he says to this Haman that I want you to build me a lofty building. And the reason is, so he claims, I can look upon this God of Moses. He, he understood that God was the most high. God was above the heavens. And in his arrogance, he thought, and how arrogant that is in respect to modern knowledge that we have, that he could build a tower and look upon the God of Moses. Now, some Christians and some Christian Orientalists had pointed out that the word Haman, or the term Haman, is a name that is given to a Persian ruler or a Persian courtier in the Bible some 1,200 years after the time of Moses. So they said that, look, Muhammad couldn't even copy the Bible properly. He took some name from some later time in the Bible and then plonked it in the time of Moses. Well, I mean, there's a problem with that, first of all. And one of the big problems is there was no Bible in Arabic in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. The Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, also was illiterate. He couldn't read and write. From where was he receiving this knowledge? Who was the rabbi or the priest that was feeding him all of this information? It's very hard to explain such a thing in rational terms. And certainly from all the accounts that we have of the life of the Prophet and all the information that we have with us, we don't find any such individual who could have been supplying such detailed information. And then this individual, how come he managed to get this information wrong? Again, these are not really viable hypotheses. However, it is only recently that we have been able to discover a truly amazing fact. When Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt, he sent out various scholars in order to do research, and one of them came across a truly remarkable thing. It is called the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone allowed, for the first time in thousands of years, hieroglyphs to be deciphered. And the reason is, is because the Rosetta Stone had a particular inscription, a quite lengthy inscription, in hieroglyphs, a more modern form of hieroglyphs, and then in Greek. 
So by comparing the inscriptions, they were able to begin to translate and to decipher the hieroglyphs. Now, scholars have been working, of course, on translating the hieroglyphs. And I myself remember personally when a group of students in Cambridge University who were trying to go through some of the claims of the Orientalists that the Qur'an had been copied from the Bible, and their intention, of course, was to refute that. And so they went to one of these dictionary of hieroglyphical terms in order to try and find out if there was such a person as Haman in ancient Egypt. Now, although there was a lack of information in English, they did find a book in German. And looking through this book, they came across a truly remarkable discovery. Surely enough, there was indeed a particular title of a person. And this title was exactly that, Haman. Now, when we look at who was Haman, what was this title? What did this Haman do? In other words, it was a position. It wasn't the name of a particular individual necessarily. It was the name of a position in Egyptian society. And what was this position? Haman is the master of the quarry of those people who build with stone. Now, isn't that truly remarkable? That Pharaoh is saying, O oh, master of the quarry, O oh, master of the people who build the stone, build for me a lofty tower that I may look upon this God of Pharaoh. You will not find this anywhere in the Bible. You will only find this in the Qur'an. The knowledge of reading hieroglyphs, as I have mentioned, was lost hundreds of years before the time of Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Yet in the Qur'an, Pharaoh is using an exactly accurate historical term. The question you have to answer is from where did the Prophet Muhammad May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Get this information. From where did he get such amazing knowledge? I think you know by now. Surely the penny must be starting to drop. Surely the cogs must be starting to line up in place. Surely the realization must be dawning upon you, if it is not already, that indeed the Qur'an is the revelation from Allah the creator of the heavens and the earth, for the benefit and the mercy of all of mankind. Now, the next subject that we want to deal with is a truly fascinating subject, and it will take a couple of episodes for us to go through it. And that is called the witnessing of the people of the book. That's what I've called it. And it's also dealing with the prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him in the Bible. Now, who are the people of the book? The people of the book, according to the Qur'an, as they, call, it is, as they are called, Ahl al-Kitab, means essentially the Jews and the Christians. First and foremost, it means the Jews and the Christians. They are Ahl al-Kitab. Why? Because they have a scripture. The Jews have the Torah, the Christians have the Injil, or combined together, it's what we know as the Bible. Now, there are some other scriptures, of course, for example, the Jews do have other scriptures called the Talmud. And for the Jews, that is a very important collection of documents. And ancient Christians, before the time of the Council of Nicaea, which is, was held about 345 years after the time of Jesus, when the Gospels we know today as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were canonized and formalized as being part of the Bible. In fact, it's important to understand what does the Qur'an teach about the Bible? The Qur'an teaches us that the Jews and Christians have scripture with them. And they have enough scripture with them in order for them to be able to know the truth. However, the scriptures they have have been altered and corrupted. Either things have been added or things have been deleted or things have been adjusted in one way or another. So this is what the Qur'an says, for example, in the second chapter of the Qur'an. The Qur'an tells us, Woe to those who write the book with their own hands, and they say, This is from Allah, 
and it is not from Allah, and they know that well. So the Quran says that there are people who are saying, our book is from God, our Bible is from God. But it is a book that they have changed, and they have changed it with their hands, and then, by the way, they are doing that until this day. And they claim it is from God, and they know perfectly well that it is not from God. So woe to them for what their hands write, and woe to them for the small gain that they get thereby. However, that doesn't mean that we can't find information in the Bible. It doesn't mean that we can't glean some information out there. We believe, as Muslims, that there is enough truth left in those scriptures through which and by which a sincere and honest Christian or a sincere and honest Jew could come to know the truth of monotheism, that indeed there is only one God. And this is what we believe was the message of Jesus. We do not believe that Jesus called people to worship himself. No, he called people to worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. Just like Moses called people to worship the creator of the heavens and the earth alone. And to submit themselves to his divinely revealed guidance. This is what we call Islam. Sincere submission to the will of the creator of the heavens and the earth. Please subscribe to our channel. Kindly like, share and comment on our videos. If anyone benefits because of your like and share, then God may provide you with unlimited reward which is called Sadaqat al Jariyah in Islam. Sadaqat al Jariyah is continuous rewards received for good actions, deeds and spreading knowledge. It is a gift that not only benefits us in this life, but also benefits us and our loved ones in the hereafter. According to the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, narrated by Muslim. When a person dies, all the deeds end except three. A continuing charity, beneficial knowledge, and a child who prays for them.